Good morning and a very warm welcome from AVK and from FESTA this morning. Can I just get a quick um, indication, please? The sound's good and visual's good. Yes, Russell. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, once again, a warm welcome. So today is the second of our webinar series. The first session we had a couple of months, a couple of weeks back, dealt with common use process valves in the industry. And then next month's session is to do with basic pneumatics for process automation. But today, specifically, we're talking about how to size actuators for butterfly valves and ball valves. And you might ask, why is it important? Uh, why this topic itself? Well, the simple reason for it is that we find in industry, a lot of people tend to apply rule of thumb or, or generalize or, or take a bit of a guess at it's the sizing of the actuator for the butterfly valve and ball valve. And where that may be right in most instances, there are applications where, of course, you're oversizing the, the actuator and, in, in essence, wasting money on an oversized actuator for an application or potentially undersizing it if you don't understand the first principles or the or the rationale behind the, 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 the size of the actuator. And of course, um, potentially may have problems with control or with early fatigue or whatever those um, conditions might be. So it's obviously critical that you understand how to properly size actuators for butterfly valves and ball valves. Um, a few more ground rules. Um, this is also the introduction in session today. So it's not a detailed uh, presentation. Uh, so if you want more information, please by all means contact either AVK or Festo and we can provide you more detailed information about this topic itself. Moving on. So my name is Russell Schultz. I head up the process automation department for Festo and I'm accompanied by my co-host this morning, Rolf Rundorf. He's from AVK, uh, a living legend with regards to process automation, being around for 50 years in the industry and heads up currently heads up the Academy, which is a training facility of ABKs. You also might be asking why Festo and why ABK? Why are we doing this, this, this joint venture? The essence of it is that process automation systems are systems and, and you can't look at a butterfly valve or a ball valve or a knife cave valve in isolation to the automation side of things. And we combining expertise essentially to provide you detailed information about the process valve, which is obviously very important, and of course, how you can automate the process. So we believe that by combining our efforts, we can provide you the very best information for your application, hence the approach we've taken. Some general housekeeping rules. You'll notice that your microphones are muted and will be unmuted right until the end for the questioning time, so don't think that your system is broken. That's how it's supposed to be. You can type your questions under the questions section of the webinar tool. There is also a raise the flag option, or you can raise your attention. That function is, is, is working, but we won't be responding to it. So please, if you have questions, type them into the questions section, and we'll respond to them during the presentation or otherwise afterwards. Just some general th notes. Undock your webcams for a better presentation view. You don't have to see my ugly mug, then you can see the entire presentation screen itself. And please note, we'll be playing some videos. And when we do play the video, you need to bring your video viewing plane forward so you get a better view of the video we're presenting to you. So that's pretty much it from our side. Let's start. We'd like to kick off with a video. Um, the, video is with the, guy, the video is going to show how a, 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 a rack and pinion actuator works. And um, I'm just going to get it right in place in the meantime. And you may say, but why are we looking at this? Well, of course, butterfly valves and ball valves, generally speaking, are driven by quarter turn actuators, either scotch choke design or rack and pinion. We'll take a look at the rack and pinion design first, and then we we'll walk through the presentation. So this is a typical Rack and pinion design, you can see the rack is attached to the piston itself so as the air pushes it backwards and forwards. So it turns the, the pinion, which is the drive part, connected to the actuator. You can adjust your actuator to the spring pressure requirements of the system. So whether it be 3 bar, or 4 bar, or 5 bar, 
and then very important is you have these options to adjust your end positioning. so that becomes critical when you are making sure that your valve is seating and opening properly in operating conditions also it's quite easy to change the orientation of the system so if it's anti-clockwise or clockwise you can simply remove the ball valve butterfly valve move the caps change the orientation of the rack around put it back together again and suddenly your direction has changed it's a very simple process Excellent. All right. I'd just like to confirm you can see the main screen again, please, if you don't mind. Yes, yes, very Russell. Well. Right. All right, Rolf, it's over to you. Good morning, everybody, and I uh, hope you're going to enjoy the session today. Firstly, we're going to look at ball valves and actually it's the sizing of a ball valve. There's a few parameters we need to look at. And in first principle size and calculation of ball valves, we need the following, the make or the brand. In this case, we're using IPV ball valve, flange NC 150, one inch or 25 millimeter diameter. And we're going to use steam at 150 degrees C, five bar pressure. Now, uh, if you go to steam tables, you see that we in saturation, so saturated wet steam. Single acting fail to close is what we're going to require. Open close function, and we're taking air pressure at five bar. Now the five bar, be careful, that need to be your air pressure at your installation point, not at your compressor. What we call the right hand check process. So we basically, look at the five fingers and we allocate our processes to that to make sure that we have the correct information. Firstly, the basic valve type. In this case, we're talking ball valve and we need to know what is the most important specifications applicable. Secondly, the media. We need in detailed information there. Very often, people are giving you insufficient information and they get a bit annoyed if our people are asking too many questions. Guys, it's critical to ensure chemical compatibility on your application and choosing the correct trim for your valve. If we look at the next item, the media pressure and temperature. Pressure, the more the pressure, the more torque is normally required. Temperature, there's limitations on our seating materials. There's also limitations on gland packings and that, that we need the temperature to comply with. The size and the end connection. We need to know that to ensure it will fit into your piping system and there won't be any problems once you get your control valve. And lastly, we need to look at individual specification requirements. So is it a standard or certification requirement that we need to know of? Very often people say, but what's that got to do with the price? Yes, sir. Well, I often find that typical specifications or things like ATEX requirements, water certificates, the valve is approved for water industry or water applications. What else have you sort of found uh, in the industry is, is, is a typical specification that might be required? Yes, if you're in the chemical industry, there may be requirements of special gland seals. There may be requirements of fire safe. So there, there is a number of specification requirements. But then also on the certification, you know, do you want a specific specification which will affect the manufacture of the valve there will be more hold points there will be more quality requirements so it's, it's critical that we know that up front because just offering a standard valve 
and then coming back and say, but we needed this or that, actually creates a problem. In the water industry and the firefighting industry, you need to have compliance of your materials to drinking water. Fire systems must be your FM approved. So there's, there's a lot of things that we, we need to really look at there. Great. Thank you, Rolf. So we have now got our valve in the middle there, and we say, any further requirements or specifications here? No, none. We've got the size, we've got the end connection, the type of valve, two-piece or three-piece design, whichever valve we're actually using. We define the medium by saying it's steam, and we've got the pressure five bar, 150 degrees centigrade, so we've ticked all the boxes. We can now carry on, on to the next item. What is a process automation actuator specific, specification? Sorry. So it's, we need to now specify a quarter turn actuator complying to what we need. Firstly, the type of valve, most important, because torques will vary between valve types and also between brands. So we need that first, and we've ticked that box now. The medium. If we look at medium, it's very critical. We say liquid. A liquid can be trickle, it can be water, it can be anything. And everyone will have a different torque requirement, more restriction. Gas, is it a wet gas, is it a dry gas? Is it the explosable gas that we need to have special requirements? Real. So the media becomes critical. Yes, sir. I think it's an interesting talking point. I think we do discuss this later on. Um, but honestly, it's important to stress that the selection of the media affects the, the safety factor. And the safety factor, of course, in turn affects the, the torque requirement of the actual valve itself. So this is often overlooked and often generalized, but I think a super important point to stress. Yes, sir. So that's critical because if we go to the safety factors that we need, uh, we will actually elaborate on this and show you how we actually need to apply certain factors for various applications. If we look at the next item, the air supply. Very often people say, well, it's five bar. Is it five bar at your compressor? Is it five bar at your valve installation? Just remember there are pressure losses along your system and where your valve is installed, you may not have five bar. So it's really important that we have an indication of the pressure near a point of installation or not just at the compressor. The higher the air pressure, the more output we'll get from our actuator. If we look at the function of the actuator, is it a single or a double acting? Single acting means that we apply air and we've got a spring that will do the closing or opening. Double acting normally supply air to either side of our pistons to give us the required torque. So now we look at the torque requirement of the process valve. There's various ways to do this. The one is to do it from basic principles. We start from scratch, or there is what we call a PVA tool, where you can actually put the information on a computerized system to get the results. So what are we going to look at next? So we now have Tick the boxes, actuate a function, single acting fail to close. Torque requirement of the process valve we'll get from a data sheet. The type of valve is a ball valve. The media has been confirmed as five bar steam at 150 and we've checked it and it's saturated, so it's not a dry application. And we've confirmed that our air supply is five bar at our valve. So, We've now ticked all the boxes, so we can now start looking at 
how do we get from first principle the actual safety factor that we need? The safety factor calculation normally starts with what is a seat factor? If we're in a high temperature application or a higher pressure application, we may need to change our seating material. So for standard applications up to about 150 degrees centigrade where we are, PTFE is a standard material. It's got the lowest friction and that would be a factor of one. If we go higher in our temperature and pressure, we may want to have a reinforced Teflon. Now the reinforcing is a glass type of filler and that offers more resistance. So we need a factor of 1.3. If we go to higher temperature applications over 250 degrees centigrade, then we start looking at metal to metal, stellated seats and Obviously, with the metal to metal, you have a much higher seat factor that we need to apply. In this case, we're talking 1.5 to 2. Next, we look at our service factor. What happens in our system? Are we having a clean fluid? Yes, it's a clean fluid that we're looking at. So our service factor will be 1.1 in this particular case. It's saturated steam. Yes, so we tick that box. So if you look at the left-hand side, we've got a seat factor. We said PTF is fine for that application. Our service factor is saturated steam, so we're happy with that. And it's an on-off application, open-close, so the control factor is one. Rolf? Yes. I think something to point out to the audience is that sometimes I find that people make the assumption that there's no distinction between open and closed con uh, control and a modulating control. In other words, we define open and closed solenoid valve opens and closes the actuator to either open or closed position and modulating normally is when it's controlled by a positioner. Very few people actually know that you need to have more torque in the system to provide you the better control required for the conditions of opening or modulating. Something uh, something I picked up is, is often overlooked. I don't know if in your experience you found the same thing. Yes, uh, when, when you look at the modulating control, you're actually stopping and starting at intermediate positions. And what you then have, you've got the effect of the flow in the piping system which also creates additional torque requirements. And if you go modulating control, it's always good to look at a different type of actuator than a rack and pinion. You would look at a scotch yoke type. Because with a scotch yoke, you've got a variable length arm that you actually give you more torque at intermediate positions than your rack and pinion. So yes, you definitely need to look at that. Great. Okay, so we're happy now. We've, we've arrived at a factor for this particular valve. That's 1.1. 1.1, that is on the left-hand side on our column there, 1.1 safety. So if we now look at the first principle calculation, breakaway torque at the medium pressure. Now, if we look at this particular table, you see bottom left-hand side, torque figures include a 50% safety factor. Why manufacturers do that is to, is to ensure that people, when they start using valves and not go through the process of what we've just gone through there, that they're fairly safe in the application. And if we want to go to first principles, we really need to take out that safety factor. So in this case, we've got 24 Newton meters, including our safety factor. And also to note on the table, as you go to the right-hand side from where we are with our marker there, as the pressure increase, the torque increase. So your line pressure is critical. So, We've now established that we've got an operating torque, which is breakaway times the safety factor. The operating torque is a 24 at 5 bar for the steam application that we're looking at. 
and that includes the safety. So we divide it by 1.5 to get the actual torque without safety, which is then 16 bar. And we apply our safety factor, and then we say our operating torque requirement is 17.6 Newton meters, and we can size according to that if we go to our actuator. Thank you, Rolf. I think what I forgot to do in the beginning is introduce the concept. So we are looking at first principle sizing in the first part of the exercise to take a look at how you could work out the operating torque from just some basics, uh, calculate the pen and a paper, and working out the basic requirements for the um, for sizing. And then we'll take a look at using software to, to, to run the same simulation. So we're taking a look at two scenarios today. But in any case, Rolf has not determined that the minimum torque requirement is 17.6. So we need to make sure we choose then an actuator that has at least that, uh, it, it can generate at least that torque to, to operate this, the, the valve itself. So I've taken a selection uh, from our catalog pages. Um, this can be any, any, any catalog page for that matter. It happens to be a DPD 40. So size 40, rack and pinion styled Festo actuator. If I go and take a look, this is a single acting action and it's operating at a five bar. So I need to make sure that I choose a spring set. Remember from the earlier video, you need a spring set that matches the air pressure of the system. In this case, it's five bars. So I choose a spring set of 50. And if I take a look, I drag my mouse slightly to the right hand side. I see this particular actuator puts out 11.5 Newton meter. It's the lowest torque it provides at zero degrees rotation. And that's not going to be sufficient for application, as I said, was 17.6, which Rolf calculated. So the DPD-40 is not the right actuator for this application to be undersized. So let's move on. And this is the process you typically use if you're using first, principle, um, first principles to determine the right size actuator. I then go up to the next size actuator, which is the DPD-80. I choose in the same spring set, 5. And I look at the minimum torque it produces, and that's 24.7. So it makes sense that this particular actuator produces 24.7 Newton meters at its minimum torque output, which is enough to overcome or to is, is enough for the 17.6 uh, torque requirement of the application. So you won't always get an exact match, but you need to make sure at least that the actuator can match or exceed the requirements of the valve. So this would be a right match. A DPD-80 in this case from FESTA would be the right match for the application. Russell? Yes, Rolf. What, what is the negative contemplation if you oversize your actuator? Rolf, it's a costing thing, um, I think, first and foremost. So if you oversize the actuator, you're obviously paying more for a, a, a unit that is that is always designed to produce more torque. And potentially, you can imagine that if you've got 20, 30, 40 in your installation, it's, it's exponential in terms of the cost of the company itself. So from our side, really, it is a, a big cost drive um, to not si oversize the actuator. Uh, is there a also, your air consumption requirements, that, that could also be a factor. Of course. In South Africa, we're very blasé about air requirements, air usage. In Europe, they're particularly strict. So that is certainly a very valid point. We need to consider the fact that a bigger size actuator consumes more air. So effectively, besides the initial uh, capital cost of the component itself, of course, you now wasting uh, money on, um, on, on, on not unnecessary, but um, oversized air capacity. Very valid point, Rolf. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, so now we're at a point now where we're going to take a look at uh, software sizing exercise. As I already mentioned, there are multiple tools in the industry that are available. I'm going to use the FESTA tool, which is online, but you could use anything that you're familiar with. The point is you plug in the parameters and it then provides you the answer you need. But you'll see just now that you still need to have a basic understanding from first principles, particularly when it comes to the safety factor, which we stressed already. So in this instance, we're looking at a ball valve application. It needs to be two inch in size. All right, it's a flange NC150 interface. It's for a steam application at 150 degrees Celsius. And the medium pressure, or the media pressure is five bar. 
It's a single acting application and fail to close, which means that if the air fails or the electricity fails, it must close the airline or the, in this case, the steam line. It's an open and close function, so it's not controlled by a positioner. And the instrument air pressure at this particular point is 3.5 bar. All right, so somehow in the factory, there's also air losses and we only have 3.5 bar available. So let's go take a look at the exercise now. Just give me a second while we open up the software. Can I confirm that you can now see my screen that shows the Festo website, please? Yes, yes. Russell. Excellent. All right. Now, if you went to the Festo website, I'll show you this once. Um, if you went to the Festo website and you went to products section of the website, I'll give it a couple of seconds to update. And then you scrolled all the way down to process automation, the topic we're discussing today. You click on that. And then you scroll right to the bottom of the page again. You look at the process valve assembly. I'm going to choose a ball valve assembly. So I click on KVZB. There are further prompts to provide you more information about this. I just happened to be able to know the system quite well. And then I click on the picture of the ball valve configurator. And just a confirmation again, but you should see a screen that says ball valve unit KVZB with a small image of a, a system, a ball valve assembly in the left-hand corner. Is that the case, please? Yes. Great. Okay. So the very first block we need to fit, fulfill or complete is a systems block. And it's asking me, is this automation, uh, is this actuation Manual or automatic? And as he's already stated now, it is an automatic application, so we want it to be driven by an actuator. We spoke earlier on about the fact that you can course choose the type of certification you require. Now it's prompting me and saying, do you require EX certification? In this application, I'm saying, no, I don't require it, but of course it is available to you. And then is the application controlled or open and closed? We've already stated this is an open and closed function. It's not it's not position by positioner, so I click on that block. And folk, I'm trying to show you that, that, that obviously you can always, and I think you should always understand first principles, but software like this, of course, is designed to make your life easier. So it's always good to know the options you have available. You can choose the type of position indication you like. So for example, if you require an optical sensor or a sensor with electrical plus optical indication, that's available. In this instance, I'm saying, well, I don't require it, so I'm not going to choose it. And then you also can select the type of pilot valve you require. Do you need to have a valve mounted to the side of the actuator, or is it remotely controlled from a valve terminal or possibly some other remote mount valve? In this instance, I'm making an assumption. I'm saying I don't require it, so I click that box. And then if I move slowly to the top of the page, you'll see that there's now a blue tick in the systems block or the tab. And I can now move on to the valve and medium section. So I'm going to click on that and give it a couple of milliseconds to update your end. So the next prompt it provides, it says, what is the connection type? And what I'd like to do here is also show you that if you're uncertain of what it's asking for, you can always click on the I button. And the I button provides you information about the very selection options there. So it's just a bit more detail. Now, we already know from this application we're looking for a flange connection options. I'm choosing flanged and already mentioned I'm looking for NC class 150 valve. So I make that selection. So we're now taking care, taking care of the interface. Okay. Now some critical elements. Medium pressure. This is not referring to the air pressure or to the, the supply pressure to the system, also called the instrument air. This is now referring to the medium pressure of the media that you selected for the operation itself. Okay, so we already said this is steam and it was at five bar pressure. So I'm choosing 10 bar. And then the temperature is quite specific. This is referring to the minimum temperature. We know the maximum temperature is 150. Let's plug in zero for a minimum temperature in this case. And a maximum temperature of 150 degrees Celsius. As per the application. And then prompts me for the size of the valve. In this case, once again, it's a DN50, a two inch valve. So I'll make that selection, but of course you can drop down to other sizes as well. And then importantly is what should it do if there's an air failure or electrical failure? We already stated we wanted to close. So I say that closed is my normal position. 
All right, we won't go into detail now, but there are a couple other prompts for the type of housing material and so forth. We'll keep it as stainless steel for this application to make things simple. And you'll notice that the Volvo medium box is ticked. So we're ready to proceed to the next block, which is application. So a couple more options available for us now. So motor operation describes whether it's single acting or double acting. I already mentioned this is a single acting application, so I'll make that selection. Very important, already stressed, but let's stress again, is the air pressure at the point of application. So we're saying 3.5 bars, what we have at that point in the factory. Okay, so now is the critical part, safety factor. Now, we have a application for steam, and we can choose a safety factor. So it's important to know how Rolf derived the safety factor earlier. This is a different application, but take a look here. These are some general rule of thumbs with regards to safety factors for ball valves and butterfly valves. You'll notice that for liquids, it's suggesting 1.2. For sticky or for viscous materials, 1.6. And gaseous materials, 1.5. But these are generalized call it rule of thumbs in the system. You should actually have worked out what it is that you need to apply to it. I know in this case that a safety factor of 1.2 will be sufficient, so I'm happy with that. But once again, it is application specific, so please make sure you understand your environment well. All right, the ambient temperature, ambient temperature maximum minimum is assumed, and also the type of pilot thread and the corrosion resistance is assumed in this case is all by default. You can make selections uh, if you have a more corrosive environment or a different type of, 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 of thread um, connection. And at this point, you can see at the top of the screen, the system block is ticked, the Volvo medium block is ticked, the application block is ticked, which means if I say order code and as I show, I click on that, it will show me a C number. The system is now thinking what it's doing in the background. It's generating a configuration for this particular application. So it's configured an assembly for us that's unique to the requirements I've entered in as parameters. So if I click on that C number, I say control C and I go to the FESTA support portal and I plug that C number into the search tab and I press enter, the system will generate a unique bill of materials that is specifically for that assembly I've, I've generated. So take a look here. Below we have the ball valve and its description and a part number, the actuator and the reducing sleeve. So these three components make up that specific assembly. So you have two options at this point in time. You of course can order in the individual components and assemble yourself, or you can simply use that C number to generate a list of components, well, uh, assembly, and Festo, for example, can put it together for you. Just the two options you have available. I'm going to switch back now to the presentation. Just give me a moment, please. Excellent. All right. So that shows you the distinction between sizing from first principles and sizing using software tools. I think what's important to note is that you need to understand how the safety factors derive, very critical. We mentioned early on that there's two types of commonly used quarter turn actuators, namely the rack and pinion type and the scotch yoke type. I'd like to quickly show you a video now of the scotch yoke type. I won't talk over the video because it's quite short. We can discuss it afterwards. Just give me a moment, please. Excellent. Quick confirmation, please. Can you see the main presentation screen again, please? Yes. Great. Okay. So just a brief description of the rack and pinion design. It's often referred to as a reciprocating motion mechanism. It converts a linear motion to rotary motion or rotary motion to linear motion. In the case of the rack and pinion, of the Scotch oak design, it's converting, taking the air pressure, converting a linear motion to a, a, a rotary motion. Rolf has already mentioned it's particularly effective for 
butterfly VoIP applications because of its unique torque curve. So it has a high torque at the beginning and end of its of its torque curve, which provides you the ability to, of course, overcome the breakaway torque required, the resistance provided by the seals or by the um, seating arrangement or the valve in question. It's not that important, but it's not as popular in South Africa as in other uh, parts of the world. I was talking to Rolf earlier on saying that in Europe, in the water plants, particularly in Germany, the only design that they actually allow for is, is, the, rack, is the Scott Joke design because in principle it uses less air and it's a slightly, a slightly um, smaller footprint. So it is more economical uh, and has a, lot, a smaller carbon footprint essentially. Rolf, it's over you, to you. Yes. Yeah, before we, we go off the Scott joke, I think uh, we really need to have a closer look at it in our day-to-day -day applications. Because if you have a plant with a couple of hundred actuators and you can downsize just one size, your cost saving in terms of actuation and secondly of your running cost for air supply is a lot lower. So it becomes a real economic long-term solution as well. And offering the high torque in intermediate positions where you have some materials that's sticky or sometimes creating a, a more problems, the Scotch oak will actually perform better. Right, next we're going to look at butterfly valve and actuate the sizing exercise. We're going to start from first principles again. So we are going to start from scratch and then we'll do the automated process. So from first principle sizing calculation of butterfly valves, what do we have? It's a butterfly valve, it's a wafer type. Uh, in this case, we're going to look at the loose liner or replaceable liner. Valve rating PN16, size DN350, and standard DIN EN1092-1. That relates to the BS specification 4504 as well, and used to be BS EN now, with Britain moving out of the EN European side, I think we'll go back to the BS one. Water at 120 degrees centigrade, six bar pressure. If you check that on your task, you'll see that you are not in a steam application because of the pressure you store in a liquid form. Then we're going to look at a double acting application with a fail to close function. It's open close, so we're not going to modulate. And instrument air pressure available is six bar in our example. So now we can start looking at our right hand check process again. Firstly, basic type of valve, and we have identified that as a wafer valve with a loose liner. So we can Rolf. select from there. Yes, sir. In South Africa, once again, it's very common to use loose liners, but there are alternatives to it as well. Um, maybe just a quick, uh, quick note on what options we have available for butterfly valves and the type of liner options. Yes, we are looking at replaceable or loose liners, which normally require a little bit higher torque than a bonded liner, which is bonded to your body. And there are limitations in loose liners in terms of vacuum applications. And if you're going in a high frequency application, there's a lot more stress on your rubber. Then people start re preferring to have a bonded liner. But then also the material of the liner has got a major effect. Is it EPDM, natural rubber, high temperature EPDM, Vitom? Because different rubbers has got different hardnesses, we also need to look at that. So there's quite a few factors just from a basic valve type that we really need to look at the application and the, the actual seating that we use. I think it's just good to know there are options available. Yes. yes, the main usage is EPDM, which is fairly good on a wide range of applications. It's also 
friendly to water, drinking water applications. But when we go into the process industry, very often you need to go to nitriles and other rivers. So it becomes a selection according to media. If we look at the media, yes, we need to know what is a com chemical compatibility, especially with our rivers and also our disk materials. So once we've established that we now have water or at the temperature, so we don't worry too much about the chemical compatibility there. The media pressure we've specified at six bar and the temperature of 120 degrees centigrade. So we have got that ticked. And the next we need to look at is the size and the connection. We have specified a 350 millimeter and we said it's a standard PSEN 1092-1. Individual specifications, so are there any special requirements? Are there any standards that apply to this process or are there special certification requirements? Especially when it gets to water, there's rest, there's all sorts of specifications that come into it that qualify it as being usable for drinking water. So, how do we do now? Don't require any more additional specifications. There's nothing required. Size we've confirmed, our flange connection we've confirmed. We've confirmed the type of valve being a butterfly valve with a loose liner. Media, we selected the stainless steel disc with the EPDM, which we know is suitable and well preferred because it gives you a much better life with a stainless steel in your application rather than having a ductile iron disc with the EMP coating. Because if your EMP coating gets damaged in any way, uh, you will have a problem with corrosion. And we have got our temperature and pressure at six bar and 120 degrees centigrade. So we ticked all the boxes. So next we're going to look at the process. We specify a quarter turn actuator because it's a butterfly valve. So the most important is there, we have got a butterfly valve and we need to know what requirements follow. We've got our medias, we said it's a liquid, it's not sticky, it's not a gas, so we're happy with that. Air supply, five bar. Uh, I think we stick to that for the moment and we're happy that we've got enough air pressure there for our system. Next, we'll look at, is it single or double acting? We have already selected that. We said that we want a valve that will go to operate. Torque requirement of the valve, once again, we use either the PVA tool or we use the manufacturer's information from whoever the, the valve is supplied, which will have a chart from where we can select the torque requirements. Next, we will look at our requirements for torque. There we go. So we've ticked all our boxes. We've said double acting fail to close. Now be careful because you get single acting fail to close and this is double acting fail to close. We get the data sheet for the process valve that we're going to use. Water six bar at 60 degrees centigrade. Uh, there is a little bit of anomaly here. If we say six bar air supply, we actually decided to up the pressure a little bit to give you more of a variety. And the type of valve is a butterfly valve, loose line are very important. So now we can carry on to our first principle sizing we will once again look at the safety factor. So if we look at what are we using? In this case, I'm going to recommend we use an EPDM high temperature because we're operating at 120 degrees and the normal EPDM is normally good up to about 90 degrees centigrade. So if we go to the seat factor, we select 1.1. 1 .1. 
service factor, it's clean fluid, saturated steam or water. It's water in this case, so we have another 1.1 factor. And what is our application? Is it open close? So we can use a factor of one. Once again, if we were going to a modulating application, we would use a higher factor of 1.3 to make sure that we do get sufficient torque in the intermediate positions if we modulate. Especially important on butterfly valves because your flow, especially higher flows, has got a tendency to increase the torque. If we now look at the chart that we have here from a supplier, there's already a 30% safety factor included. Different to the ball valve where there was a 50%, this has got a 30%. If we can now go down to chart, we can now see that the size is 350 and we're operating with six bar. So we need a torque of 375 according to this chart. So if we now go to the actual calculations, we will see that firstly, there's a 30% included in our operating torque. So the breakaway torque, we divide by 1.3. We apply two factors of 1.1. And if you multiply that out, your safety factor is 1.21. So the actual operating torque, if we go back to without any margin, it's 289. We multiply that by 1.21 and we get, we need an operating torque of 350 Newton meters from our actuator to really operate this valve properly. Excellent, Rolf. So we now know that we need 350 Newton meters of breakaway torque. In a very similar vein to what we did earlier on, we've got a specification chart in front of us. We're going to take a look at the operating conditions, the air conditions, we single acting, and we require a spring pack of six. And we can see here that, that at that particular, of this particular actuator, DPD 900, at the spring pack of six for six bar, 325.1 is the torque it sits out or puts out, which is now, of course, less than the 350 you require. So theoretically, what we do, we go and take a look at the next size up, which is the DPD 1200. We took a, take a look at the right spring back selection, and that's now 479.4, which exceeds the requirement of 350. So in this instance, the DPD 1200 would be the right type of actuator for the application itself. So from first principles, we successfully have put together a specification. In a similar vein, if you take a look at a software sizing application, so let's take a look at a different scenario. So it's a butterfly valve in this case. It's a wafer, PN16, a rating, pressure rating, a design rating, I should rather say, DN200, DIN standard. We're putting water through it at 60 degrees Celsius and 10 bar pressure, double acting. We've got an open and close function. In other words, it's not uh, been modulated. And the instrument air pressure, very importantly, is four bar. Let's take a look at what the design software will do for us now. So I'm opening up the Fester tool again. I've short-circuited the process and already chosen the butterfly valve configurator. Can somebody just give me an indication, please, so they can see my screen with the Fester butterfly valve configurator online, please? Yes, it's there. Great, okay. So I'll make the selection. I'll say this is now an automatic selection. I'd say it's not controlled, it's open and closed. So once you get the hang of it, it's very quick. And then I say no end back, end uh, position feedback, and I don't require pilot valve. So the couple of clicks I've made the selection, I've ticked off the systems tick box. And I can go now to Volvo Media. I choose a flange type, it's wafer. I say I like the DIN standard. I like to make sure that its um, design pressure is for, for 16 bar, so I choose PN16 but the media pressure is 10 bar, note the difference. And then I need to go to size DN200, I'll make that selection. Yeah, it's up to you understanding the materials and what the reaction might be with the, the, the media going through it, but I know stainless steel is compatible with this particular media, so I'm choosing stainless steel, and EPDM certainly is very safe, but you can make the selection according to the material and the media, I should rather say. Then I choose the applications tick box, 
And I say the mode of operation in this case is double acting. So I make the double acting selection. I say I'd like it to close in a fail safe condition. You can see how quick this is, gentlemen and ladies. My operating pressure is very important. I said it's four bar. So that's my instrument air that's available to me at the point. I'll choose four bar. I'm gonna choose a general safety factor of 1.35, but as Rolf and I already mentioned, please make sure you understand this for your application and the rest are pre-selected, so I'm not gonna worry about that. And similarly, I go and click on the order code and say show. And the C code's available to me, so I can either order it as a complete assembly from Festo or I can get a breakdown of components. And that's how simple it is, folk. So back to the presentation that we have run through simulations both from first principles and from software and we're at the finally finale of the presentation and just a couple of quick tips and tricks from us so for butterfly voles the first trick is or the first tip is set the actuator in stops at operating pressure plus 10 bar don't set it at plus the design pressure but set it at the operating pressure right and that also applies to bore valves incidentally so a lot of folk try and size the actuators according to design pressure but importantly it's at the operating pressure and then Rolf this is a very important point install the valve in the line uh, in, in in the disc in line with the valve slightly cracked open you know quickly mention why that's important yes just remember when we're looking at a wafer butterfly valve your ends are rubber that rubber is an actual fact your gasket so firstly don't add any gaskets secondly when you install the valve in compressor rubber rubber is incompressible it will move but it'll move towards the center of your valve and that will then tend to bind your valve if you set it at 100 percent closed position so we crack it slightly open and then we bolt it in position and then we start operating the valve else we may damage our liners thank you no oh, thank you that's a very important point thank you rolf and next brings us to the end of the presentation i know we run slightly over but we're now opening the microphones for questions and a bit of interaction so sky do you want to perhaps handle the section for us please Yes, uh, thank you, Russell. Um, we have two questions that have come in. The first one was from Andrew. He asked, when the butterfly valve is opening halfway, what can the individual do to correct the situation? I've tentatively answered there and said, uh, without looking at the application, if the valve was originally sized correctly, I would say first check the actuator compressed air to make sure the pressure is at it was originally designed for. If okay, then possibly there's an obstruction or additional friction in the system. And to correct that, um, it would possibly need to be removed to investigate. Any further thoughts on that? I think it's a logical question. Uh, uh, your side, Rolf. Yeah, it sounds as the valve is stuck in that particular position and it's not moving. Now, this is on the, one of the cases where maybe you're using a rack and pinion and if this valve is operated at various positions, it means that you now don't have sufficient torque to actually move it from that intermediate position. And also the flow in your pipeline will also add torque that you need to operate the valve. So that's just, uh, you know, we, we don't have enough information to really give you the, the final answer, but you're welcome to send us a mail and then we will look at it and respond to you. Thank you. Yeah, Rolf, what I have found sometimes is for rack and pinion design actuators is sometimes if it's used for positioning or control, a portion of the rack can be worn away and that's where you lose control possibly. Just another bit of tip, oh, another tip from our side is that a sensor box option that is also available as opposed to normally a digital signal saying it's open or closed is to have an analog value coming back. So you always can get precise feedback about the position of a butterfly valve, not just making assumption as opposed to where it should be. Okay, and then the next question is, what is double acting uh, failed to close? In other words, we all understand single acting, the, the spring would activate it in the failed position, but if you have double acting, um, what is failed to close? Um, I, could con I would consider maybe the, 
the, the pneumatic solenoid valve. Um, but is there anything further you would like to add to that? Well, that's a good a good a good preempt to say you you should pick up this topic in the next session we have uh, next month where we discuss uh, basic pneumatic principles of process automation. But I think to answer this particular question, yes, yeah, Sky normally that valve is controlled by a five two way solenoid valve that has a spring function. So in other words, when the coil power is removed or when if uh, when a coil power is removed, it then fails back to a certain position. So it's by nature it's controlled by the pilot solenoid valve, the five two way valve that has a spring return function that creates that closed position. Okay, and then the next question is, what is the distance between the valve and its wall? I think we might need a little bit more information there. So the question is, what is the distance between the valve and its wall? Possibly, I think for this purpose, let's, let's park the question and get back to the particular person. Okay, and then um, the next question is, how often do you carry out maintenance on actuators? How long is a piece of string, I suppose? Eh? I think it depends purely on the system you have, the air quality of the of the of the of the system, um, and how often. Yeah, those conditions make a big a big difference to the longevity of an actuator. There's some very clever information around um, pre pre predictive and preventative maintenance, which also I suppose we could discuss maybe as part of the next session, it's just a small uh, thought um, about what Twister can do when it comes to preventing or detecting that the switching time is not what it should be. And therefore you get a preemptive warning that the valve isn't responding like it should do. Um, but look, uh, it's entirely based on your environment and your application to work out the right sequence and the right uh, occurrences of your maintenance schedule. Maybe I can just add something there, Russell. Um, from experience, we know that the, the quality of the compressed air makes a big difference on your actuator life. And so first of all, make sure, sure that you use a good quality air. Um, if the air is as per specified with the actuator, then the supplier of the actuator can give you what they often call the B10 values. So it's the expected life. So it's not quite maintenance, but at least um, you know how long it should last. And if it says it'll last, say, a million opening and closing cycles, you can then just check your application. And when you get to maybe 75% of that, you could pull it out and change the seals, or if it's a critical process, possibly just change the actuator uh, to make sure that there is no failure unexpectedly. I think what you did mention, Sky, is very important to stress is the air quality is 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 critical. And very often, I mean, you may mentioned now that the life cycle is predetermined of these units, provided that the air quality is is the right of the right standard. So where we have found premature failures in the past is not because of the equipment um, being inferior or inadequate. It's mainly because the air quality conditions aren't what they should be. And in this in this field, FESTA has comprehensive understanding of different types of filtration, different types of grades of air preparation. So a lot can be done to make sure that your process and your process equipment is properly protected and gives you the life and return you expect. Okay, there's another question around maintenance. Is there any specific maintenance and care required for the actuators? Is the, uh, is the actuator um, can be repaired if damaged due to wear and tear? On what conditions can one adjust the actuator? So there's a couple questions there. It says, is there any specific maintenance and care required for the actuators? Possibly you can briefly answer that first. So certainly all the components for the actuator can be replaced uh, out. You can replace the seals, you can replace the rack, you can change the pinion. So that's definitely an option available for you. Um, all pneumatic equipment, at least from Festo's side, is pre-greased for life. So provided that your air quality is what it should be, you actually don't need to grease um, your equipment, particularly actuators, uh, during its lifetime. But that depends on your air quality itself. Maybe I've ticked that box. Okay. Uh, if I may uh, just come in here, mm. uh, on, on valves, we, we normally recommend a regular quarterly and six-month inspection. 
Now, when you do your inspection to check with your valve connections and everything is still fine, I think that's also a sort of a regular maintenance check on your actuator, especially on the drive components, because that's where you might get some wear depending on the number of cycles you're doing. So you can do that sort of regular quarterly inspections. If you're on very high cycle, yes, you might want to do monthly because the valve may need also to be looked at on a monthly basis. So it's a variable, very dependent on your process. Thanks. Okay, and then the next one is... Sorry, Sky. Uh, where would one find air usage and volume for different actuator sizes? In other words, the actuator air consumption. In the FESTA catalog, it is in the catalog pages, investigation pages, it's available there. I think it depends on from supplier to supplier. Certainly, it's it's a, it's a value that's available from the FESTA catalog itself in the spec pages. Um, but it depends on who your supplier is, um, where they locate that information, but it should be under that detail. Okay, and there's just a comment from uh, Clinton saying that uh, a reminder when using steam, to use a, um, a coupler to, to separate the, the actuator and the, the valve itself so that you don't have heat transfer from the, the, the steam side, which is passing through the valve, to the actuator. Thanks very much, Clinton. The point. And then uh, uh, Peter said, how does one select the 4 to 20 milliamps feedback for solenoids, limits, etc.?" In other words, today we spoke about the valve and the actuator, but he says in your selection, where's the selection for your, your feedback, 40, 20 milliamps, um, your limits, um, in other words, your switch box. So if you recall in the configurating to, configurate online tool, the configurating tool, you had an option of different switch box um, devices. We chose, in, in, in instance, every case, not to have any feedback, but you could choose under that section what type of feedback you require, whether it's simple digital feedback or whether, for example, it's analog. So that's available there. Okay, then uh, Basil said, um, in addition, a selection of solenoid valve. So in other words, match the flow of the solenoid valve to the flow requirements of the actuator. Um, wh where would that selection be? that isn't available inside this particular tool. Um, it, that will be based on understanding of, 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 I think, of basic pneumatic principles. Once again, I don't mean to, to tout the next course, but it might be a good starting point for us to discuss those things in the next course, which will be taking place next month. But that can be determined, um, not in this tool, but certainly outside of the scope quite easily. Okay, I think we're running a little bit tight on time. We're a little bit over. I'd like to just take one more question. There's a specific, question for Rolf and it says please advise a couple of tips to extend the life of the seat on steam valves in automatic control are there any tips there so the question is please advise a couple of tips to extend the life of the seat on steam valves in automatic control okay I think the most important thing there is that if you're in automatic control are you controlling the flow or is it on off if it's on off, make sure that you do have a fairly quick closing action. So you don't have high velocity steam running through a slow closing valve. So that is the one thing that we need to look at. Uh, your selection of your seating material is critical. Make sure that's also the best material for the application. Uh, you don't say the type of valve. You know, it can be a butterfly valve, can be a ball valve. And if you look at ball valves on steam, we normally uh, utilize a graphite filled PTFE. One of the reasons for that is your PTFE doesn't transfer heat. And if you add the carbon filler, you actually transfer the heat to the valve body away from the, the high temperature steam. But once again, do not throttle. If it's a ball valve also, get it to close fairly quickly to the final close position. Okay. Um, any more? Not sure. Rolf, carry on, any, sorry. Yeah, yeah. If there's any more questions, please just send us a mail, uh, details of your process, then we can analyze it for you completely and give you advice on that. Okay, thanks. Th thanks very much. Um, 
In closing, Russell, if there's anything you'd like to say, and then Kersha, possibly you could uh, just mention the, the format going forward if someone would like a copy of this presentation or ask any further questions. Yeah, well, thank you very much once again for your participation today. I hope that it has been of, of value to you. Of course, there's a lot more to say around these topics and the questions that you pose. So please feel free to contact uh, ABK and FEST and we'll address these concerns of yours. Now, I know that around the process automation applications, people though tend to make it sound very simplistic, but very often uh, unnecessary wear and tear or fail or premature failure can be sorted out by some basic tips and tricks that we picked up over the years. So by all means, contact us and we'll, we'll gladly assist you. But thank you for your attendance and we look forward to you in the next webinar series. Thank you. Uh, just after this webinar, you will receive an email with a link to a survey. If you could please fill that out for us and give, you your feedback, um, give us your feedback. There will also be a question that asks if you'd like a copy of this presentation, which you can fill out there. And if there are any other additional questions you have, please do post it and we'll get back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, folks. Thank you.